read our scripture for today in our notes. Yes, sir. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, Lord, for today. Today is an awesome day, God, that you created. Uh, we are rejoicing and we are glad in it. Uh, Lord, you are mighty and wonderful, God. And I thank you for today having this class, God, that we are able to learn apologetics, which is the defense, God, of your word, God, and the defense of our belief. Uh, Jesus, I pray that uh, all minds are open, uh, all ears are open and attentive to your word, God, and to the lecture that's bring, uh, that Pastor Joe is bringing forth. And I pray that it's a great class uh, with great questions and uh, open concerns. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. And then I'll pull up the notes and you can read it from either your copy or from my screen share. Yep. Okay. Romans 118 through 23. All right. Romans 118 through 23. <clears throat> The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Or since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, neither they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds and animals and reptiles. Amen. So that is our key foundational scripture for today as we get into week six, chapter five, apologetics as proof, moving on from the transcendental arguments for God, now moving to the theistic arguments for God. And the theistic arguments for God are shared by all styles of apologists. Now, before we distinguish that the presuppositional apologist uh, relies heavily upon the transcendental argument for God and will want to make sure that whoever they're discussing with, discussing the, 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 the situation or the issues with, understands that without the Christian God, there can be no rationality, there can be no intelligibility. The classical apologist will start on a neutral ground of autonomous reasoning that man has reasoning from God and that doesn't need to be established. And then from the reasoning, man can be shown that God is the best explanation or probably true based on certain evidences or arguments. And from there, the classical apologist will go from a generic God that would apply to all monotheistic religions to a particular Christian view of God. And then the evidential apologist will go right for evidence of Christianity and then meet the unbeliever on neutral ground and ask them to evaluate the evidence, primarily using the resurrection of Jesus or something like that. Now, when we look at the classical and the evidentialist being the two main other ones outside of presuppositional, what they have in common is that they both allow the person they're discussing with to start with their reasoning and not having to give an explanation for it. And we call that autonomous reasoning. So they don't have to give an explanation for their reasoning outside of themselves and that they have it. So they have that in common. Now, the presuppositionalist, like we said, is going to address the presuppositions of the nonbeliever and say, why can you or how do you reason? Why does reasoning work? Why are you here? Why is the world intelligible? Like we talked about before from Einstein, the one incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. But that doesn't mean that the presuppositionalist is only going to use transcendental arguments for God, abbreviated as TAG, T-A-G. And transcendental arguments for God are addressing the presuppositions of the non-believer. We're not just going to stay there the entire discussion and say, how do you know what you know? 
that's really what the presuppositional uh, transcendental argument is. It's how do you know what you know? But at some point, based upon the Holy Spirit, because we believe that we're to be led of the Spirit, not every, not one conversation is going to be alike, that at some point we do want to use evidences and arguments outside of the transcendental argument for God for the unbeliever. And so what does the presuppositional do with theistic arguments is basically what this chapter is in Dr. John Frame's book on apologetics. That's the book we're using for this class. And so we want to kind of summarize what he said in this chapter. And as I said before, we're going to be moving more and more away from the book and more towards my experience in these following chapters, because this is more of where I'm an expert and have more experience. So I added this in for what I gathered from him and what I have seen in my experience. So as a presuppositional apologist, here's how I'm going to use the five theistic arguments that we're going to learn today. And these are the theistic arguments that all apologists use. So all different approaches will use these same arguments. So number one, for the presuppositionalist, and let me just say this based on Romans, the presuppositionalist based in Scripture is never talking to anyone that has an excuse for not believing in God. We believe that God has made it plain to them. God has used the creation of the world and his invisible qualities to show his eternal power and divine nature. It is clearly seen, understood by those who have been made by him so that people are without excuse. So even though people can say, I don't know, I'm an agnostic, A as the negative, gnosis, knowledge, I don't know, agnostic, or A as the negative, theist, I am a, a, a non-believer in God, they can say those things, but they are truly foolish in their heart. Their hearts are darkened. And so once again, we want to know who they are according to Scripture and address them as the Bible tells us to address them. And that's why it's always important, even when we use theistic arguments for God, like the five we're going to discuss today, we remember these main points, which is, number one, we're using the argument to show them that all truth is God's truth. We use these arguments to show that all the truth is God's truth grounded and established in Scripture. So take, for example, when people were letting out blood in the early American history, they thought that that would help uh, get people free from disease. But the Bible says life's in the blood. Now, maybe there might have been an argument from a Christian and a doctor at that time, and the doctor might have used some kind of rationality to say, well, if we get rid of all the blood, then we can start over fresh. Something maybe like a blood transfusion. But remember, they weren't replacing the blood with good blood. They were just draining out bad blood. So they may have said, well, get rid of the bad blood. The body will replenish and we'll be fine. But we understand that most diseases have nothing to do with the blood flow, but a healthy body needs blood flow. So you might have been a Christian then standing on the word saying, life's in the blood. We shouldn't do that. And here this doctor would have tried to convince you otherwise. Now in time, science has caught up. The medical world has caught up. We see that it's not good to ever drain blood in that way. And the same thing is now with modern science. When People used to think that the universe was in a steady state, that there was no real change in the universe. It was just being rearranged matter. But the universe was in a steady state, kind of like an ocean may have the same amount of water in it or a, you know, a body of water. And it can get rearranged and put up and down and maybe go to, to, uh, to the atmosphere and come back down. But it's all just still going to be there. And that's one uh, thing to understand about water. Water can't leave our planet. We have had the same amount since day one. Very, very little could possibly leave, but they say that the 99.99% of water has always been here. Now, they may say that's how the universe was. But and once again, as a Christian, we would have said, no, the universe had a beginning, and then it expanded. The Bible says he stretched forth the heavens. So not only did it have a beginning, but it was expanded as well. Now, if you had been arguing with the scientists before science caught up, they might have used that kind of analogy of water and these different things. And the Christian might have felt like, well, they don't have any real evidence other than the word of God. 
Well, later on, science did catch up and it showed red shift. They saw that the stars and the way that the colors of them changed. And we began to understand that not only did the universe have a beginning, if you rewound it all the way back, it had a point of singularity, but also it was still expanding right now that we were still being uh, separated from these uh, stars and they were moving away from us and each other like a balloon expanding. Everybody's, if you put a dot on a balloon and you blow it up, uh, you see it expand and move away. And so not only are we, are they moving a far stars and galaxies moving away from us, but we're also moving away from them as uh, the balloon expands. And so now today we're not arguing for a God of the gaps. We are saying that everything within nature can be explained through science that that God has put inside of nature the ability for us to use laws and principles, mathematics, logic to discover things. But we understand that those explanations themselves need an explanation. So like Sir Isaac Newton wrote more about the Bible than he did about physics. And physics is really just the study of nature. And so he started to understand how gravity worked and how the planets rotated. And this has really been the foundation of modern day physics. But even uh, Sir Isaac Newton said, I can describe to you mathematic, uh, mathematically the rotation of the planets, but I can't tell you why they're there and why they're moving the way they're moving based on those laws. Now, somebody may come, and, and sometimes they do, to try to put down that, that quote, and they say, oh, well, all Sir Isaac Newton did was say, I can explain this, I don't know this, therefore God did it. But that wasn't what he was saying. That would have been foolish. That would have been contradicting the whole reason why he was explaining what he was explaining. What he was just trying to say is, no matter how many times you back up the question, Ultimately, God in his sovereignty is going to have the reason to why things are the way they are. So you could look at a difference between a how and a why question. How the planets rotate is like a naturalistic thing that God built into the system that we can understand how they rotate, how animals adapt over time to their environment, how uh, the brain functions with the mind, etc. But we'll never know why. Why comes from a person? Why has to come from a, an intelligent person? And then at this point, sometimes atheists say, well, we don't need to know why. But then that's the problem we talked about before. If we see a small ball, ball in the woods, it's a good question to ask, why is there a ball here? And then, and then the ball gets bigger. And then you ask the question, why is it here? Maybe the ball is now the size of the earth. And you ask, well, why is the ball here? Well, if the ball becomes the size of the universe, is it still right to ask, why is the ball here? Absolutely. So it's never a wrong question. So it's actually anti-scientific to not ask why. So I like what uh, one man said, and we talked about this, Joe B., last week about a talk that got removed from TED because it rocked the atheistic worldview. And he said in his talk, Rupert did, and you can just see it, the talk that was banned from TED. He said, my friend, when he talks to atheists, he says, hey, guys, all you want us to do is grant you the first miracle, and then you say you'll explain the rest. Well, the first miracle is your entire problem. Where did everything come from? Why is it here? Why is it intelligible? Okay, so the presuppositionalist has no problem discussing any branch of science, and at any time, if there seems to be a scientific discovery that goes against the Bible, we're going to make sure we're interpreting the Bible correctly. And then if we're interpreting it correctly, we're going to stand on the scripture until science catches up. And so let me give you an example, one more. So at times people used to think the earth was flat, but the Bible talks about the circumference of the earth. Okay. Okay. But maybe some Christians thought this way. Maybe some Old Testament prophets thought this way because that was a common understanding of the world at that time, okay? So not every prophet knew everything, but we believe that actually the Scripture is not just prophets' opinions. It's the inspired Word of God, whether they understood what they were writing or not, okay? So if you would have asked Isaiah, Isaiah, do you think the world is flat? If he would have said yes, that wouldn't have changed anything because when he's writing scripture, he's going beyond his own understanding. He's going to God's. Same thing with Moses writing the first five books of the Bible. Now watch this. Let's say we're looking at the prophets 
And we may think that they're talking about a flat earth. They're using maybe language like we do. The sun rises and sets, etc. Well, we even still do that today, and we know the earth is round. But at some point, does scripture teach us that the earth is round? It does, okay? And so maybe they use the same idioms we do, but God reveals in scripture the earth is round. Now, during the time of the Middle Ages, people started to realize that whatever view the world had had before about the earth was wrong, and it was circular. And so what the theologians needed to do was go back to the scripture and see, do we have evidence for that in the Bible, or do we need to hold on to the flat earth mentality of the belief that we had? And they began to realize, oh, the Bible actually talks about this. And it wasn't like they were trying to make a round peg fit in a square hole. They really saw that that's what it was. So they were able to adjust their belief back to what the original was according to the Bible. And we can do that too, if we're interpreting the Bible correctly. Uh, and, and there's different other examples I can give you, but I think you understand that. But when we know there are true violations of God's word, for example, uh, Adam wasn't a literal person. Evolution says that we came from ape-like ancestors. Well, we know that scripture teaches against that. So we're going to stand on scripture and believe that science is going to catch up and eventually show us the complexity of the human nature as opposed to the ape-like creatures. And guess what? That's what we're finding after Darwin. See, Darwin really was rudimentary looking at these two creatures, uh, us and, and uh, these creatures, the ape-like uh, people, you know, like ape-like uh, animals, uh, you know, chimpanzees, you know, monkeys, whatever. And he was saying, oh, they have five fingers and we have five fingers. They have eyes and their skulls like ours. But he had no idea about chromosomes and genes. And now that time has gone on, we realize now that there are millions of difference, differences in our gene code, and the smallest amount of these genes change the entire structure of the body, the physiology of the creature, and through just small changes, creatures die. You know, like you just talk about like miscarriages in the woman's womb, just a few of these things being off or uh, with Down syndrome, you know, and here we're trying to say, oh, it's so similar, but really what, what the difference is is so vast to what is actually uh, a human to an ape-like ancestor. And so once again, science caught up to that. And I could go on all day. Science at one time when we were discovering DNA, thought that junk DNA was just something that didn't really serve a purpose. Maybe that was left over from evolution. Science caught up and began to discover what junk DNA actually did. And onward and onward. So we're going to stand on the truth of God's word because we believe it's self-attesting. We're going to believe that only scripture can give us the answers to all the whys of why we do science, why we have logic, why we have mathematics. And then whatever we see in science that confirms the scriptures, we're going to use it as evidence to help the world see that our Bible is true. And if there are differences, you know, differences in the evidence, we're willing to go back and search the scripture to see if we might have missed something. But if it's blatantly against scripture, we've been around long enough as a Christian people that we are going to stay true to the word of God and not change our beliefs. The next thing as a presuppositionalist is we're going to use these theistic arguments to reveal man's rebellion. So according to Romans 1.20, the sinner already has clearly seen and understood most, if not all, of these basic arguments. So when we're, when we're talking about the argument from morality or the argument from the first cause, the cosmological argument, we're showing them you already know this really intuitively. You know on the inside of you there are morals. And where do morals come from? They don't come from evolution the way you would describe it as a non-believer. Or morals don't come from your book, Islam or Hinduism. They don't come this way. Your gods are just as messed up as you are. You read the stories of uh, the Bhagavad Gita and so forth, you know. Uh, the gods are no different than men. And so this is how we show them you're in rebellion to God. This is obvious. This is clear. And then we encourage this sinner, uh, the non-believer, to repent. So when the truth is given and the sinner's rebellion is confronted, they now have the best chance to repent of their sins and put their faith in Jesus. So we show them that God, the God of the Bible, is the only candidate for the God of morality, the God of the first cause. 
the God of epistemology, the God of how we know things, um, the, you know, the God of ontology, the perfect God. This is the Christian God. And now it's easier for them to come and repent because truth is coming, and the Bible says the truth will set you free. And as we talked about before, this is the advantage that we have as non-Calvinists because we don't believe that God sovereignly determines who will believe and who will not believe. We believe that man has a free will to choose, and so based on this evidence, they will be responsible for what they do or do not do, and we as the gospel preacher are giving them ample opportunities because of God's grace. Now, before I get into these five theistic arguments for God, do you guys have any comments or questions um, about how we're going to use these arguments? Because I know some of you at the beginning were maybe thinking all we were going to do was be presuppositionalists and not take advantage of the wealth of knowledge is out there. And so hopefully, you know, we addressed that earlier. You're, you're, you know, you're waking up to the fact like just because we're presupps and love tag arguments doesn't mean we're not going to rock them with the rest of these things because all truth is God's truth. But uh, if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to do so. Okay, I hear noise, but I don't hear questions. Okay. All right, let me just go through them quickly, and then we can spend the rest of the time reviewing them. And if we have any time, we can watch the videos. Most of them come from Dr. William Lane Cray. Okay, Chris, we want to make sure you just stay muted, sir. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Five theistic arguments for God. The moral argument. The argument for God from objective moral truths. The second one, the epistemological argument. The argument against naturalism. So this is one where we show that only Christianity can give you knowledge, and that's what epistemology means. Number three, the teleological argument, the argument from design and creation, very similar to the watchmaking uh, argument. If you, if you see a watch on the beach, you assume a watchmaker. You see the complexity of the world. You see a designer. Number four, the cosmological argument for the cosmos, the argument from the first cause, and this talks about why everything is the way it is. And there's also a sister argument to this by Leibniz that talks about whatever existing um, being a necessary, uh, uh, a necessary being. And he talks about uh, for anything to exist, you need a necessary being. And the necessary being can't be uh, the necessary thing, rather, can't be the universe. It has to be God. So um, you can't, because you can you can conceive not a universe, or you can conceive not this universe. So this can't be the necessary thing. And so he kind of takes that to another level, but that's uh, the number four cosmological. And then the fifth, which uh, sometimes people don't like to use because it is a bit uh, hard to follow, we may watch the video on this one, but it is actually a very good argument. It's very similar to a presuppositional argument uh, in that it really challenges your mind and bases a lot in what your mind can perceive. And the ontological argument is the argument from God's perfect being. Okay, so let's look at these five arguments. The videos are there always to go back and to view for yourself, share it with your friends. The moral argument, the argument for God from objective moral truths. Now, most of these arguments are very simple, but they're so profound. So let's just go through them and see if you have any questions. I think we'll have plenty of time to take questions as we go through it and still have our half-hour discussion. Okay, premise one, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Premise two, Objective moral values and duties do exist, therefore God exists. Okay, so let's just look at this. How would somebody attack this? They would probably attack it either in premise one or two. I mean, that's pretty much the only places they can, but uh, let me show you where um, they'll attack it in one. They say, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist, some people will try to say 
that we can have objective moral values and duties without God. Now, that is in, in itself a fallacious argument. And so let me just explain. They'll try to root. Uh, let me first just say this. There are many atheists and non-believers. Now, a lot of these will address non-believers by, uh, I mean, atheists. Okay, so some of these will be agreed upon by other religions. But remember, it's only the Trinitarian God that can explain why this is coherent. The God of Islam can't do it, the God of Hinduism, etc. And we'll get into those things when we get to the gospel uh, next week. Okay, so right here, uh, many, many, many atheists will say, absolutely true. If there is no God, there are no objective mor moral uh, values. And you remember we read one in class. Let's see if Joe B. remembers. Who did we read in class, Joe B., that says, there is no free will, there is no objective moral values, you can do whatever you want. Who, who said that? Matt Rosenberg. Exactly. Rosenberg. Alex Rosenberg. So that most atheists will agree with that. But there will be some who will try to say they can exist, but they can exist without God. And then we have to go beyond just a moral value, which to me, I could stand on that ground and prove it to them. But where I like to just do it really simply is go to duties and say, if there isn't a God, Tell me why I would have to keep objective moral values. Let's just, for the sake of argument, say you're right, that for some reason, like a platonic mindset, that there is a universe that's uncreated, and in that universe there are literal abstract objects called morality that exist and come to all of us. This is what Plato believed. He was a great philosopher, so some people will, will, will be this. And so they'll try to get away from a God and just say, things just are the way they are. The universe doesn't need a cause. It just is the way it is. And we don't need an answer for mora morals and logic. It just is the way it is. So the way I would attack that right off the bat is say, well, can you give me a reason to why then we would have to do it? Just even if there was objective moral values, though, of course, there's not without of God. But just say there were, why would we have to do it? A, a moral value is nothing unless it has a command behind it or an obligation. So uh, you can know the speed limit is 70, but why should you keep it? And just because uh, you believe it's a good thing doesn't mean you're going to keep it. And so uh, we, if there was a godless world and objective moral values, there would still be no duties to have to do it. So you're basically right back at the beginning point. But then we could easily argue, which I hope all of you could, you could easily argue against Platonism or an idea that objective moral values are without God because you would just basically say, where'd they come from? And then when they go to that Platonism and try to sound really smart, and by the way, they like to do that to say, you know, I, I say this, then you would just say, where does Platonism come from? Where do abstract objects come from? And if they say, I don't know, then you go back to the arguments we do before an attack. You show them, I don't know is not an acceptable answer. It's not an acceptable answer when the ball is this small or the ball is that big, right? The other thing that people, like we said, will object to is to say, well, there are no objective moral values. It's all just whatever we do in the construct of societies, how we were brought up. And then they'll say something like, you know, in some cultures, uh, you, you know, uh, transgenderism is accepted, like in maybe Indonesia and some of these tribal religions, these men would dress up like women. So uh, in India, they used to do this. And so here we think it's wrong. They think it's right. You know, you say tomato, I say tomato. Well, then we have to simply say, if there is no objective moral values or duties, then why should I care what you have to say? Because you could be lying to me right now because you just admitted there's no objective moral values. So how would I ever know you're telling me the truth? And then number two, why should we ever care about anybody else's values? And so they may say, well, for human flourishing, you'll even hear this now where people, I remember listening to, listening to this on Parks and Recreation, where actually the awkward girl there, uh, what is the awkward girl's name? Oh, Andy's girlfriend. Okay, got to go to Google now. You guys are slow. We all watch Parks and Rec. You know, well, well many of you do. Andy's 
good old friend. Nothing like a rabbit trail here. Parks and Rec. April. Thank you. Finally, saved me a journey there. So April literally said when she was doing something with the pets, I like pets better than humans. So what would you, how would you stop that person? They literally just said that. I like pets better than humans. So somebody's saying, well, there's no objective moral values, but we're all supposed to treat each other nice. And it's like, okay, well, here you have somebody that says, I like pets more than I like humans. So what if they want to be on a planet with about 10 humans and a billion pets? How are you going to stop them? You see, it's nonsense. So we use a lot of, and we're going to talk about the rebuttals to these things. We use a lot of the transcendental arguments to rebut their objections. Because why would you object to this unless you were in rebellion towards our God? Unless you were in rebellion towards our God, you would accept this. It's common sense. Okay. Uh, maybe hold your questions because I am going a little bit longer than I thought on explaining them. So don't, don't forget them. Write them down, please. Number two the epistemological argument, the argument against naturalism, this is done by uh, Alvin Plantica. This video is by Dr. William Lane Craig, and he does a lot of work on the cosmological argument, probably the best one out there right now. And he is a classical apologist. And the epistemological argument is basically saying you can't know anything unless there's a God. And we talked about that in our tag argument, but the reason why we bring it up now is because a lot of the heavy hitters in philosophy, in physics, are all pointing to this. So like Thomas Nagel, Paul Davies, uh, uh, Alvin Plantinga, uh, basically uh, uh, Alex Rosenberg from the opposite side, being the crazy nihilist that he is, would say, well, you really can't know anything because you don't even exist. You know? So there's a lot of this going on in the scientific world. And we need to show the unbeliever this is where they are if they don't have the belief in God. If they don't have a belief in God, the only game in town is naturalism. And naturalism just basically says everything is in the natural world. There is nothing outside of the natural world. Well, if that's true, there is no warrant for knowing anything to be true. And, and as um, Alvin Plantica explains in his video here, that if you believe in naturalism, you have to believe in evolution because that's how we got here. We didn't get created. We were made over time over random mutations, right? And so then what he says is over those the time period of random mutations, you never know what the brain did because the brain was never looking for truth. It was looking for survival. So now you wouldn't even know what you know is true or not because your brain is not looking for truth. Your brain was looking for survival. And this is where you get into Lennox, the great mathematician. I should have named him before John Lennox said he talks to people all the time. And he says, where do you get all these ideas from against God? And they, you know, all these uh, proofs they have. And, uh, you know, they say, my brain. And he, and he says, where'd your brain come from? Well, it came from evolution. And he says, and you trust it? And you trust your brain? Why would you trust a monkey's brain? And that's literally what uh, Darwin said. And this was Darwin's great doubt is why would we trust what a monkey's brain was thinking? And so what now people say back to this is, well, we do science and we do experimentation, and it, thinks, and it seems like these things are corresponding to us. But once again, when we bring up now the response to that, the transcendental arguments, how do you even know you're here? How do you know you're interacting with the world? where gravity works like this. I mean, you may be that brain in a vat. There's, there's no way. So this is, you know, uncomfortable to think about, but it could be true. So imagine, uh, you know, almost think of the matrix, but I'll, I'll, I'll twist it up here just a little bit. So imagine almost uh, a thousand years ago, we reached the pinnacle of our human uh, uh, evolution. And so really right now, it's, it's not... Uh, as we would think 2017, like if we were thinking in time wise, maybe it's like 20,000 AD, like literally 20,000 years into the future. And so now we have learned how to create virtual worlds that are indistinguishable from real worlds. So, I mean, you just think about how fast technology moved from Pong on Atari to now Call of Duty, right? So you're looking at 18,000 years. And this is uh, uh, honestly what Elon Musk of Tesla cars believes. 
he believes we're in a virtual world. He, he says it's a one in a billion chance that this is actually an actual world because of this argument on uh, this idea I'm bringing to you. So they created worlds that were indistinguishable from our worlds. And they also learned how to create different characters and play them randomly throughout their lifetimes that now they can live, say, a million years. Let's say now they've you know evolved, maybe like in some of these things, you'll see like in Stargate. Science fiction, by the way, will help you a lot with arguments, you know, because it just helps your imagination. C.S. Lewis was a great philosopher, used, used science fiction. So they're, they're an advanced human, 20,000 years in the future. Their bodies are totally different. They can live a million years. And now they can create virtual worlds that are indistinguishable from our worlds. And they've populated, you know, just immensely. So there's trillions of them on multiple planets now. Literally, we could just be their character. They could be playing us for 80 years. And 80 years to their million years would be like us playing a video game for a few few hours, right? So for, so for them, they, they totally invest in this. It's a fun thing to do. Uh, Daryl, I'll meet you there. You'll be black this time. I'll be Joe. I'll be white. You know, uh, I'll get married to a Latina. I'll get married to a Greek, you know, whatever. And we'll just, we'll play the game out. And after the 80 years is over, we'll, we'll meet for lunch somewhere in one of our galaxy, uh, galactic cafes. Do you get what I'm saying? You would not know. You would not know if you were there right now. You would have no way of saying, I can't, Prove I can prove that's wrong, okay? Because evolution offers you, as we talked about before, no foundation for any truth, okay? So if naturalism is true, there's no warrant. That's justified true belief to know anything. Now, we do know things to be true, and you could put in there, without defeaters. So the things that would begin to defeat uh, the idea that I'm in a virtual world and all of these things would be basically all of our experiences, the God of the Bible, history as we know it, et cetera, et cetera. There's no glitch in the matrix. We don't see that, you know, deja vus aren't glitches. We don't see things happening in a weird way. We're not seeing pixels, you know. Um, and so the idea would be we do know things to be true. Uh, we're not in a virtual world. There's no good reason to believe that. There's actually many defeaters against that belief. Therefore, naturalism is false. Natural, therefore, God exists. So it's crazy how far they're willing to go like Elon Musk to deny God. They will, they will literally say, I am in a virtual world before they will say, I'm a creation of God. Now, why, does that, why is that? Go back to Romans because it's rebellion. See, in the, in the virtual world, I can be this, I can be that, transgender, I can have sex with multiple women, I can spend money however I want, I can sleep I can sleep at bed at night. That suppression makes me feel better. But the moment they say, I'm a creation of God, what do they now have to acknowledge? The creator's will, right? Okay, moving on to the next one, the teleological argument, and that's the argument from design and creation. Premise one Design comes from purpose, and purpose comes from mind. If we look at the ocean going over the, the sand, we'll never see a intricate sand castle design or these things that they do on the beaches. Uh, we'll, with wind and rain, we'll never see Mount Rushmore. With explosions and time, we'll never see books developed, and we'll never see buildings built. Now, at this point, what they try to say is, uh, they try to say, well, living organisms mutate and change differently than non-living organisms like, way, like, like uh, wind and rain over rocks, like with Mount Rushmore or the sand with the water. But the same problem remains, though, is nothing inside the DNA or the uh, what we would call life, what produces life, Nothing there is of chance, even in the strands of DNA. That is designed. And then the laws themselves that control how DNA to particles and all of these things interact, that's designed. And so now you need a reason for the reason of design. And just simply to say it is the way it is, is foolish. And that's literally what they'll say. It's called the anthropic principle. They'll say, 
The reason why the, the world looks designed to us and the reason why you look designed is because by random chance you came out like this and it came out like that and now that's just the way it is. And so what our argument to them is, imagine if you were standing before a person, or rather you were a firing, uh, you, were, you were a person standing before a firing squad and 50 people all pointed their guns at you to have you executed. They un unload every one of their magazines and you're still alive. Now at first you could simply say, I'm alive because I'm alive. That's the fact. I'm alive because I'm alive. They missed. I'm alive. But the next question is, why am I alive? How did they miss? And so you could say, yes, the world is the way it is, and I'm alive because the world is the way it is. My lungs need oxygen because there's a world with oxygen, and that's why I'm alive. Uh, I need eyes to walk around in this world, and that's why I have eyes, so I can walk around in this world. You can say it all circular like that, but like I said with the gun example, it doesn't explain how you got there. It just explains that, yes, you function here, and something hasn't gone wrong to stop you from functioning, but it doesn't explain the right, uh, the, the reason why you have right functionality here, okay? The universe is designed, therefore God exists. And you can, I mean, you can look at all of the constants in the universe and it just, you know, some of you guys maybe have read this in other books. It's astronomical. It, I mean, to say any of this would have happened by chance. This, uh, as one person said, it takes more faith to be an atheist. And this is a blind faith. This is fideism, just to simply say, well, evolution did it. And so we throw that back at them as they try to say back to us, well, you're just saying God did it. God did it. God of the gaps. Here's something we do know. Here's something we don't know. There's a gap in between. You say God did it. And they'll say in ancient times, they said, here is thunder. We don't know why there's thunder in the middle. God did it, you know, whatever. Well, that's not true. We're saying everything in the natural world can be understood through natural means. We believe in that. But what we're trying to say is, why is all of this able to be understood? And so they try to just say it is the way it is. We call that atheism of the gaps. And so that's not what we're doing. We're actually saying this is the explanation where they don't have one. One atheist said to John Lennox that Christians are those who are afraid of the dark. And so we have to put God into everything. But he responded back and he said, uh, atheists are those who are afraid of the light. They don't want to come into the truth, okay? And so we're not living in ignorance. We understand that things can be taught and learned through mathematics. The greatest of our scientific revolution was by Christians. Even the inductive method was developed by Francis Bacon. So that's the, the foundation of what science is. Up until that time, they only really had uh, deductive reasoning, which was traditional philosophy to gain knowledge. This is kind of how we frame our arguments here. But then they discovered, the Christians did, that they could kind of go backwards with hypothesis and experimentation and, ex and explain the world that way and through what they would call inductive reasoning. So if you ever want to look at the difference of inductive and deductive, you can go more into that. But that was a Christian framework. That was our idea. That wasn't something given to us. That was something we developed. And that was, well, of course, given to us by God, but we didn't borrow that from anybody else. That was a result of our worldview. That was a result of our presuppositions. Uh, the next thing is the cosmological argument, and that's also a Dr. Craig video up here for the uh, design. The next one, the cosmological argument, is the argument from the first cause. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Therefore, God exists. Now, you know, what are the arguments going to be towards this? People are going to try to say, well, the universe never began to exist. It's always existed. But now we have a problem with that. Remember, science has disproven that. Science disproved that the universe has always existed. It actually started with a bang, a singularity. So now what they've had to do is say, well, there is a multi-universe machine that keeps making universes. But we just bumped the question one thing back. Where did a multi-universe machine come from? You see, it brings us right back to the same thing. So to say that the universe has always existed is foolishness, ad absurdum again. And so we know the universe has begun to exist, but we had to be faithful to God until science proved that with the Hubble telescope and so forth. And that was actually one of uh, Einstein's greatest problems or one of his biggest mistakes 
is that he thought the universe had always existed. And so he had to admit that he was wrong and that it had a beginning. And so you can learn about that as well. And then the last one, the ontological argument, I say that this would be a good one for us actually to watch. So give me just a second. I'll give it to you, and then um, I'll download it while we're talking here. So the ontological argument was uh, developed by Anslam, a, a church, um, a church uh, philosopher back in the day, and it basically is a proof for God. Sometimes these arguments bring you into probabilities and things like that, but he actually believed that this argument brought you to the proof of God, that you could actually say, I now have proof that God exists. And it was a simple way of saying it. There's a lot of different ways now to say it. Here's one way of saying it, and then I'll give it to you the other way, and we'll watch the video. Uh, God had, premise one, God has all perfections. Number two, existence is a perfection, should say is a perfection. And then the conclusion, therefore, God exists. Now, it kind of seems, once again, like really just like too, too simple. And a lot of atheists love to beat up on this, but it only shows them their ignorance. Uh, just like with the epistemological argument, it seems foolish at first until you understand it correctly. And Alvin Plantinga not only gets respect from Christians winning the Templeton Award, which is a high honor for Christian scholarship, but he also has the majority of atheists and non-believers respect. So like the gentleman that will be coming with us in the last day of class, Spencer, Plantinga is one of his favorite philosophers of our time. So th this is not just foolishness. It's not just saying, well, if you evolved, you can't know anything. You could be a brain in a vat. So blah, 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 blah. No, it's, it's like, no, that is the truth. Let's go into it. And every possible philosophical tool, he takes you down that road and everybody tries to defeat it and says, it, it just, it, this is simple. You know, it's almost like people trying to disprove the resurrection, like Lee Strobel. I'll be back next week, Pastor. You know, my wife just got saved, and I don't like this, and I'm a researcher. I'll, I'll be back next week, and I'll disprove this. And two years later, he converts, you know. It's the same thing. It's like, oh, no, we can, we, even though we believe in naturalism and evolution, we can know things. And it's like, I'm going to disprove this argument. And then like, you know, like two, two hours later or two years later after your brains and knots, you're like, uh, well, I, I think I'm going to give up knowledge now and become an Alex Rosenberg or I'm going to become a Christian, you know, because there's not really much more to go. It's either I don't know anything because I can't. That is true. Can't. And now I'll pretend that I do know stuff, which is his contradiction. Right. Or I'm going to say there's a truth to this. You know, God is God is real. And the same thing is with the ontological argument, uh, William Lane Craig, one of our best debaters, uh, you know, taking all that the, the great ones do. He's a great studier and, and philosopher himself. But what even makes him the, the best that he is, is like he puts it out in, in debate form. And he loves the ontological argument because it can really help you understand what we know as being. And ontology is being. If you want to know that word, it is being and epistemology is knowledge. So uh, two great things you're always going to need to remember when you're discussing philosophical concepts and philosoph philosophy, philios or uh, uh, Sophia, rather Sophia, which is philosophy where it comes from, is uh, wisdom, the love of wisdom, philio, Sophia, philio's love, Sophia's wisdom is what, what you need to know is that there's epistemology and there's ontology. Epistemology is how we know something to be true, and ontology is what something is in its essence and being. And so when we talk about how we can know that God exists, one of the ways that, that Anselm believed that we could know that God existed was the very fact that we could conceive him. So the idea is I can't conceive a married bachelor, but I can conceive a perfect being. And just like a circle can be perfect in our mind, but never totally perfectly drawn out. Like if you've ever kind of heard about that mysterious way that we can never truly draw the perfect circle, because when you bring it down to its most minute points, it's going to have a little bit difference of a circumference at some point. But we can imagine a perfect circle. The idea is we can imagine a perfect being. We can imagine 
an all necessary being. And it's rational to us. It doesn't hurt our brain to conceive of God. And that's why the majority of the world still believes in God. And they have no problem being scientists and all these other things. And it's because it's, it's rational. It fits into our mind very, very easily. And so I'll play the video for you to give you some more depth to this. But that was basically Anselm's, Anselm's uh, idea was, how could we understand such a perfect being unless that being actually existed? Now, somebody may say, I can imagine a perfect pizza or a perfect whatever. But as you'll watch the video, you'll begin to understand it's not quite that easy. But there's something about the perfect being of God that comes quite naturally to us. Okay, so let's watch this together here. In the year 1078, a monk named Anselm of Canterbury astonished the world by arguing that if it is even possible that God exists, then it follows logically that God does exist. Anselm's argument came to be called the ontological argument, and it has sharply divided philosophers ever since. The 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer called it a charming joke, but many prominent 20th century philosophers such as Charles Hartshorn, Norman Malcolm and Alvin Plantinga think that it's sound. Here it is. God can be defined as a maximally great being. If something were greater than God, then that being would be God. And in order to be maximally great, a maximally great being would have to be all-powerful, all-knowing and morally perfect in every possible world. Possible worlds are simply ways the world could have been. To say that something exists in a possible world is just to say that if the world were that way, then the thing would have existed. For example, even though unicorns don't exist in the actual world, it seems at least possible that they could have. So we can say that unicorns exist in some possible world. On the other hand, a married bachelor does not exist in any possible world because the idea of a married bachelor is logically incoherent. It could not possibly exist. So if it is possible that a maximally great being exists, then we can say that he exists in some possible world. But wait, a maximally great being would not really be maximally great if it existed in only some possible worlds. To be maximally great, it has to be all-powerful, all-knowing and morally perfect in every possible world. So think about it. If a maximally great being exists in any possible world, then it exists in every possible world. And if it exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. That is, a maximally great being actually exists. Thus, the atheist has to maintain not simply that God does not exist, but that it is impossible that God exists. Here's a summary of the ontological argument. Steps 2 through 6 are straightforward and largely uncontroversial. But what about point number 1? Clearly, if it can be shown that the idea of a God is logically incoherent, then the argument fails. But is the idea of a maximally great being absurd? Like a married bachelor or a square circle or the smell of blue? This doesn't seem to be the case. The notion of an all-powerful, all-knowing, morally perfect being that exists in every possible world seems to be a perfectly coherent idea. But couldn't we parody this argument and make it work for anything? Why not say, it's logically possible that a maximally great pizza exists. Therefore, a maximally great pizza does exist. However, the idea of a maximally great pizza is not like the idea of a maximally great being. In the first place, there aren't intrinsic maximal values that make pizzas great. There could always be one more pepperoni to increase its greatness. It's not even obvious what properties make a pizza great. Thin crust or thick crust, extra cheese, anchovies? It's relative to the taste of the consumer. In the second place, a maximally great pizza would have to exist in every logical possible world. But that would mean that it couldn't be eaten. So it wouldn't really be a pizza, because a pizza is something you can eat. 
The idea of a maximally great pizza turns out not to be a coherent idea. The idea of God, on the other hand, is an intuitively coherent idea. Therefore, his existence is a possibility. And the ontological argument shows that if God possibly exists, then God actually exists. Ooh. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> Let me uh, finish our lecture for today, and then we can get into, I'm sure, a hundred questions that you guys may be having. Let me just go now into the defenses against the tag and theistic arguments. So when we are making these arguments, they're going to start coming back with their responses. I've tried to give you some of their most popular ones to each argument. When they do, we need to use tag as a basis of defense. So before tag was a proof only, like here is the proof of these things, of intelligibility, of um, you know existence, I'm existing, etc. Well, now we're going to use it as a defense. We're going to start showing them that unless these things are true, these presuppositions that you have are unsubstantiated uh, by truth and lead us into absurdity. So if, say, somebody wants to deny that, um, take an easier one, that the universe didn't begin to exist, but there's a multiverse. So now we're going to go back in time until they can have no more explanations. And then when they say, I don't need to have an explanation, we're going to show them that's absurd. Okay. So we're going to appeal to absurdity. If a person denies the claim, they are absurd. For example, if someone denies they are a person with free will while they are freely arguing, they are absurd. Or if they deny anything that is self-attesting without any known defeaters. So it's self-attesting that I'm, in, I'm here now and I'm not in a virtual world. So to not accept that without really any defeaters or any proofs otherwise is absurd or to reject the premise, I am here. So I think you guys have heard me use those before. And if you have any questions, I can show you how to use them in the arguments, but you gotta be specific because uh, oftentimes I notice sometimes when you guys are, uh, uh, you know, you're asking questions, you kind of get confused yourself and then I don't really understand. So make sure you really write it out so I can help you to understand uh, a little bit better, okay? And thank you for the questions though. Number two, appeal to the infinite regress. We just spoke about that. If a person denies causality or intelligibility, show them they cannot know or do anything. For example, if there is no first cause, how could you be here causing things in this discussion? And if there is no first mind, which grounds all intelligibility, how do you know what you know? So remember, if we're doing things causally, I'm making actions and making uh, having causes that cause actions and reactions. I'm causing myself to have an action that has a reaction, rather. So I'm the causer of my, my own thoughts and uh, uh, actions right now. Now, if I lived in an infinite world, I would not be here able to do these things because I would have had to have been caused by something in an infinite regress. And like trying to borrow a book from Joe B that Joe B doesn't have it and Joe B has to go borrow it from Ashley and Ashley doesn't have it. If that goes on for affinity, nobody gets the book. Nobody has a cause in that world. And then the same thing is with the mind. If I don't have a mind, if I don't have a comparison to my mind to know I'm being sane, my mind could be insane and I would never know it. If I don't have a 12-inch ruler, I'll never know what a 12-inch ruler is supposed to be like. So there has to be a mind that grounds other minds for intelligibility or we could all be crazy, right? And we're not because we, we know that we're in line with each other and the, and the world that we know it is not uh, things popping into existence or foolishness. So we show them that's not the world you live in. Stop pretending that way and stop giving up everything you believe in. Like we talked about, I live in the world of I don't know. Well, stop saying that foolish stuff because you do know and you're here and you know some stuff. Okay, number three, appeal to self-refuting beliefs. And that was just an example of one. I, don't, I live in the world of I don't know. Well, how do you know that? If someone has to contradict themselves to make a point, show them that they cut the branch they're sitting on. For example, my parents had no children that lived or I don't know how to talk in English. The fact that they made the claim refutes the claim itself. More examples. There is no truth. Well, is that true? No one can really know. Do you know that? Or how do you know? And I only believe in science. Is that statement proven in science? 
And so that's where you begin to help them to see, um, well, I don't know and you don't know either. Well, how do you know I don't know when you just said I don't know? Okay, I could be there all day. Appeal to the rebellion against now acknowledging God. And these last two are really the hard issues as I put on our post, but I just simply made them five, five uh, defenses here. But uh, these last two really want to show them that they're rebelling against God. That's, that's why we're arguing in absurdity. That's why we're, we're literally having to tell Elon Musk, you're not in a virtual world, dude, because where did those people come from? Those people like in your 20,000 year history, where do they come from? All the same things apply to them. You can't run away to this virtual world to make yourself feel better. You're just right back where you are here, okay? And then you show them that the tribe that refuses to believe germs causes viruses and sickness, even after being shown textbook evidence with pictures, is ignorance. You are acting the same way. God is showing you. He's, he is saying to you, this is clearly seen. So the tribe goes, I don't believe germs cause this. It's, it's, uh, it's the voodoo man. And we're like, no, it's not the voodoo man. We keep telling them until they believe us, it's not the voodoo man. And this is so funny. They think we're the superstitious ones. Throw this right back at the unbeliever and go, no, no, no. You are the superstitious one. We're the one telling you you're not a creation of an alien. And even Richard Dawkins said this in Expelled, where uh, Ben Stein went around showing how these universities kick out all of these Christian or theistic professors because they don't agree with everybody. And that's why when they, these atheists throw back at you, but there's so many, you know, atheists in the sciences and the university, it's because so many of them are kicked out and can't do their research because if you don't dance their dance, they don't want you. So we're this one saying, let's bring all the evidence to the table. Okay. And the reason why they don't believe is because they don't want to believe and appeal to their rebellion against acknowledging their sin. The cheating husband that refuses to come clean with all the details of the affair, even after being caught. Now, think about this uh, quickly in closing. Imagine if you had a cheating. Well, let's not put it on us. Well, somebody has a cheating spouse. Let's put it that way. They hire the detective. The detective finds that the spouse is cheating. They give them the information. And then what do they do? After giving them all of that information, they now say, hey, I got the proof on this guy cheating. But let's say now the wife says, the wife goes, you know what? I want to see if my husband uh, has any integrity here and will actually admit uh, to this affair. I want to see if they're actually going to admit to it. So they take all that evidence. They take all of those things and they start bringing it up to their husband little by little just to see if they're going to acknowledge their faults, right? Let's see if they're going to do that. Now, did, you, did I lose my picture here? You guys not see me? Okay, give me just a second. Let me bring myself back up. I don't know what happened here. I don't see my picture anymore. Forgive me for that. Okay. Am I back now? Can you guys see me? Okay, good. Now, imagine she's bringing little by little by little. But let's say this husband really doesn't want to admit it. And you know this because you guys are leaders. You guys have seen how people hide in sin, right? So think about this. She goes, where were you last night? Oh, I was out at the gym. Nine o'clock at the gym, huh? You sure you were at the gym? Because, uh, you know, Bob was at the gym at nine and he didn't see you there. Oh, yeah, you know, it was. I was there around 830, but then I had to go run an errand at uh at, at Kinko's. I had to go do something for my job. Oh, okay. So you were at Kinko's. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't go get in anything to eat then, did you? No, no, I didn't. Well, then why did you come home and you were you're saying you were full because you had already eaten? Oh, oh, I grabbed something to eat on my way to Kinko's. You, you get what I'm saying? Like every little thing, and, and he's not wanting to admit it. He's not wanting to admit it. Now watch this. Let's say she goes so far as to almost just draw out every detail. And then he just looks at her and he goes, you know, don't you? I mean, come on, you know. And she goes, yes, I know. But now watch. Let's take it one more step further. This is talking about people not willing to acknowledge their sin. The person's been caught. But now she, let's say she talks to the cheating woman, the woman that was cheating with, with her husband. And so she gets all of these details. She says, I, I, I'm not angry with you. I don't care. 
I'll give you just a thousand dollars if you tell me every detail because I want to see if he'll admit up to it. Okay. So now the man is caught, and then she goes, uh, "How many times did you guys have sex?" Oh, we only did it once. You sure you only did it once? Oh, uh, well, ten times. Well, you sure? You know. And now he, ba- you know, she backs him all the way down that fact. Okay, we go to the second fact. Uh, how many times did you get together with her a week? Uh, maybe only once a week. You sure only once a week? Okay, my friends, how many know that if a man is that depraved about admitting the affair, he will be that way times a million towards God? And if he'll hide it from his wife, he'll hide it from you, the gospel preacher. Oh, snap, come on. Did that not just hit home? I hope that was worth the time that it took for me to do that bad boy, because my friends, that is the point. Sinners love their sin. They hate the gospel like a, a, a criminal hates the police. Okay. They don't want to get caught. They don't want to admit it. So there's no argument that can make the man stay committed to his wife. It, there's no proof that can make him come on somebody. I hope you, you're getting this now. There is no argument that can make the cheating spouse love his wife. There is no proof that can get him to love her after everything's been exposed. Everything has finally come out in the open. He can now say, well, forget you, woman. You just too much trouble anyway. Hello. Why do you think it is that sinners don't acknowledge God even after all the proof, all the evidence, all the testimonies, all the inner witness, all the working of the Holy Spirit? They do so because they love their sin. And that's why we got to pray for them. And that's their choice. Review questions quickly here in review. Describe the three main ways a presuppositional apologist will use the theistic arguments. They will do it uh, to show that all truth is God's truth, to reveal man's rebellion, and to encourage the sinner to repent. What are the five theistic arguments? The moral argument from objective moral truths, the epistemological argument, the argument against naturalism, the argument, uh, the teleological argument, the argument from design and creation, the cosmological argument, the argument from the first cause, and the ontological argument, the argument from God's perfect being. And then lastly, how would you defend these points? You would appeal to absurdity, the infinite regress, self-refuting beliefs. You would show them their rebellion against acknowledging God. Hey, let's just stop talking about the argument and talk about you right now. Let me tell you a story about a cheating spouse, because that's how I see you right now. And the Bible even uses that of his own people, Israel at times, and Ezekiel especially, an appeal to their rebellion against God because of their sin. So boom, shakalaka. All right. What do you guys have to discuss, ladies and gentlemen? We have over 20 minutes. We can watch some more of the videos. We can do mock debates. I can take your questions, your comments. The floor is open. I have a question for clarity. Go ahead. Uh, So in the streets, a few times I've uh, witnessed to atheists, and they'll bring up some some claim that, well, God doesn't make sense to me, but a spaghetti monster makes sense to me more. Would the ontological argument be the best place to go to in and, and those kinds of instances when people make claims of like things that are not real? Yeah, because uh, when they say, well, it's not that they're saying the spaghetti monster makes more sense. If, if I've heard the same argument, you'd have to be more clear on that because the argument that I hear is this. You say, God, I can say this flying spaghetti monster. Yeah. Okay. And once again, That is another God of the gaps kind of defense they're using against our argument. So what they're saying is, uh, you know, you don't know. I don't know either. So it's just it's your version of God. It could be this version of God. It could be the flying spaghetti monster. But now we have to, yes, use things like the ontological argument to say what kind of being is the kind of being that could do everything we're talking about. Could it be a flying spaghetti monster? It'd have to be an all-powerful being, have to be all-knowing, have to be all-present, have to live outside and exist outside of matter, space, and time because it created matter, space, and time. And it would have to be intelligible and be the source of all intelligibility. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Well, a duck called by another name is still a duck. 
God. That's what we say. So they can't make a lesser God to do away with the argument because that lesser God would not be all powerful. And it couldn't just be an alien kind of God because like we talked about before in the aliens movie series, a Prometheus, a person that comes to our planet dissolves in our water and starts off creation because then we have to ask where did that Prometheus come from? So yes, God is the greatest of all conceivable beings. The flying spaghetti monster is not. That's a conceivable being. He's on the level of Thor, and he explains nothing. And then, like I said, if they start changing the attributes of the flying spaghetti monster, then we say, you've just described God then. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Amen. Thank you. Keep it going, guys. Talk to me. Don't be shy. Um, I am, uh, as you were talking, I was still trying to think about this, but I'm trying to determine, or I guess distinguish is a better word to use, the difference between appeal to absurdity and appeal to self, self-refuting self beliefs. Okay. <clears throat> uh, can you help me with that? Yeah, can you just be uh, specific in where maybe your uh, issue would be? Yes. Uh, so, for example, even in the notes, it says a um, uh, person uh, denies the claim they are absurd. Uh, skip a couple sentences. It says if they deny anything that is self-attesting uh, without anyone known, without anyone known defeaters, uh, reject the premise out of here. Uh, let me see. Right. So uh, for part three of the notes. So uh, let me give you a second. I'm sorry. I know you're kind of reading it. Just write it down in one sentence. I want to help you guys develop a little bit better of questions with this. So Daryl, thank you. Just write, formulate the sentence, say, um, and if you want just another reiteration of them, I can do that in a moment, but I'd like for you to see if you could just write a question, like it would be one sentence and it would say something like uh, this attribute about this, seems to conflict with this, or I don't understand this in light of that. Something that you could just put in one sentence, and then um, I'll understand that a little bit better. Okay, anybody else as Daryl's formulating a question to know the difference between absurdity and uh, the infinite regress? Okay, definitely have some time to watch some videos. But let me just get Rachel in the discussion. Rachel, you're always the kind of person that I like to ask these questions to, just to see how it's coming across. Did today's lesson kind of make sense to what we're doing as presuppositionalists with these kind of arguments? Yes, I think your introduction before we got into the lesson and when you broke it down to say, um, we're, I guess the first couple of chapters is like, we're focusing on tag and we're focusing on, on like those basic arguments of saying like, do you even know what you're saying right now? But I think your introduction to this lesson saying, oh, we're going to do that. But that doesn't mean we're going to do all this right now that we're talking about right now. I think exactly. that helps clear, clarify in my mind. It's, oh, we're not not going to talk about the, the design. Part. We're not not going to talk about these things. So I think yes. that helps put it together. Because to me, I was thinking, oh, this is all we're going to be talking about. We're just going to keep on putting people like into that place where they understand, okay, there has to be God. But this really helped put the meat on the bones for me um, to understand we're going to continue on. Awesome. Yeah, because to me, there are different kinds of presuppositionalists. And sadly, there are those who just stay in that realm. But that's not who we are. So when we were watching at the beginning of the class, the videos with the guy named Sai, and he's on the streets, and he's actually kind of putting down the other books with evidence. We um, maybe I, I, I didn't have to show that video at that point, because we, we weren't saying that evidence wasn't important. John Frame actually believes that evidence is as important to us as it is to all the other kind of apologists. We just want to make sure that the people know in the discussion that which is the foundation for their reason and the foundation for their existence. And I thought he did a great job, and I'll even uh, bring it up here for review. Uh, he's, in, in last week's class, he kind of said, hey, this is what we're looking for when we're looking at presuppositional apologists, like, and what they're going to do, like, th- this is like your parameters. And he basically said, um, here, 
that we'll have a clear understanding of where our loyalties lies, where our loyalties lie, and how those loyalties affect our epistemology. So we're going to understand, no matter where we go in this conversation, where our loyalties lie, where our basis is, and how that affects how we know stuff. Number two, a determination above all to present the full teaching of Scripture in an apologetic way without compromise and its full winsome way, even if it offends people. So even as we're going to the cosmological argument, we're not just going to say, well, this is because this scientist said that, and then, you know, this scientist is true. We're going to say, God said it. God said he created the universe, and now science is caught up. God said that he designed us, that he put laws in place, and that the starry hosts, the heavens, declare his greatness, right? And then thirdly, especially a determination to present God as fully sovereign, the source of all meaning, intelligibility, and rationality as the ultimate authority for all human thought. So if we get caught in an argument with them where it's like, the universe doesn't have a beginning. Yes, it does. God said it does. And these scientists say it does. Oh, yeah, but there's these other scientists who say it doesn't have to, and they're really smart. And let me tell you about Platonism. Hey, how do you even know Platonism is true if there is no God? We bring it right back to that, that tag point and that intelligibility arguments because you don't have rationality without God. As, as, it's almost like keeping them from rabbit trails. And then number four, an understanding of the unbeliever's knowledge of God and rebellion against God, particularly, though not exclusively, as it affects his thinking. And this is something that's real important as well, is because oftentimes, and I just heard this in a recent debate, the atheist doesn't get the point that the, the person is making. So they say back to the debater, what are you saying? I can't know anything. I don't know that I'm here and I don't have uh, any mind to do science. Some of the greatest minds are atheists right now and so on and so on. And the guy goes, hold on, you miss the whole point. What I am telling you is with your worldview, you can account for the preconditions of these things. The fact that you are doing those things, what you enjoy and you love rationality, is the proof of my explanation. So we're not saying they can't be moral or no right and wrong or they can't do science. We're saying they can't explain why they do science. So that's a big difference. Amen. Well, I bought Daryl some time and then he just took off. Okay, there he is. There he is, Daryl. Big D. You ready to bring it, baby? You know what? As I continue to read both Appeal to Absurdity and Appeal to Self-Refuting Beliefs, yeah. I deduced that they are similar, uh, and, and I understand the difference between the two now. Good. Yeah, they have very uh, – almost all of these defenses have very similar points. And, and I know we discussed this after the class was over uh, – Last week, and I want to kind of reiterate here for everybody, we are not saying in our, our discussions with people, premise one, premise two. I mean, I can't even remember if I've ever done that in any discussion. So all of these things kind of go fluidly. So you, you may be like partway through the cosmological argument, and they may pop in with something over here, and then you'll go to a tag defense over here and appeal to absurdity, and then they'll say something, and then you'll jump over here to the resurrection of Jesus. Um, most conversations are not done like in a collegiate style debate. You know, you, a lot of times, like if you're at your family function or street witnessing as a person's catching a bus. You're not going to be able to be like, hey, stop. Let me go back to premise one. Now, I do agree with like we do have to try to sometimes bring back the conversation and not let it go to all those rabbit trails. But a lot of times my uh, my what, what I would call my technique is to allow them to run down some of those rabbit trails because I want to show them that we're not afraid to address them. But at the same point, if everything becomes a rabbit trail, like, dude, it's like, come on. You need to stick with one, one subject now. We're jumping all over the place. You're not letting me finish one of my points. Uh, then that's where I want to kind of come back and go like, okay, let's start with something here. Okay, so you're saying, uh, let, let's like differentiate some of these defenses. Okay, so let's say you're saying that the universe has already always existed. Okay, that's what you're saying. Now think about that. If you're saying the universe has always existed, you are now admitting that there can never be a first cause. And so there's an infinite regress of all events, 
All events cannot function in space and time. And then they may say, well, space and time is kind of an illusion of the mind. The mind understands space and time, but physical objects don't really operate the same way the mind does. It's not really a thing. It's just something we interact with, you know? And then you would say, well, how do you know that? How do you know that? Because you can't know that unless you have a place of beginning. And then you would show them that it's absurd to say that because now you don't know what you don't know. And then if they say, well, I, you know, I may not know how we interact with time and how that all works, but I do know this. Well, hold on. You've just refuted yourself now, you know? And so I think I just used all three of them there. And, that, and that's an example of how you're, do, you're, you're going to show them it's absurd. And yes, infinitely regressing things are absurd too, by the way. Um, but yes, like, like what you just said was redonkulous. It doesn't even really make any sense. Uh, number two, if we follow your train of thinking, it goes all the way back to nowhere. And then number three, because sometimes they'll actually say things in their own statements that are self-refuting. It's like, dude, even in what you just said, it's self-refuting. Um, and, and yes, you are true, uh, right, that absurdity and self-refuting are almost identical. But the reason why I separated them is because I wanted them to see that absurdity comes back to intellig uh, it's the opposite of intelligibility. And so I want you to, I want you to see, yeah, you're, you're self-refuting, but even more so than that, you don't even have an explanation to how you'll know that you're self-refuting. So it's like, I like to establish with them. Do you believe there are things like I'll hear people say this all the time when they debate with people on the streets or discuss, they'll be like, do you believe there are things that are observed and those that are things that are, that are intelligible? So it's like, that's how you're establishing it. And then throughout the discussion, you could be like, that's absurd because it is self-refuting. Like I've shown you that absurdity exists. You've admitted it, that there's a difference. And this is absurd. But yeah, you could, you could probably squash appeal to absurdity and appeal to self-refuting into one main point. And then you could probably squash rebellion against acknowledging God and against their sin into another point. So you could probably make it to... Uh, uh, three instead of five points of uh, doing the thing. But I was just trying to like make a little bit of a distinct distinction there. Th does that help also confirm what you were on Daryl? It does actually a lot. And uh, to comment on that, it's interesting because while witnessing to people, uh, you know, I know I'm, I'm everyone else is probably the same as, as I am. We probably use all of these techniques but to read about it and to understand what they are uh, really is really interesting and is helpful to have the knowledge of what techniques we're using and how we're using it. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like I said before, I didn't want you guys, because I didn't want you guys to get overwhelmed. Most of you, I think are appealing to these things, but um, the idea that it's not um, like, like you knew you were doing it, like you're like a child, like you, like you and I, we walked as children, but we didn't understand physiology. We didn't understand bone structure. We didn't understand coordination, but we were doing it. I think a lot of us naturally, because I've been around a lot of just, you know, people street witnessing and naturally you're going to be like, that's absurd. That's silly. You just refuted yourself, you know, and this even works with Mormons and other people too. So while we, <laughs> and he, this guy just set himself up because he goes, uh, you know, we can't trust the Bible because we don't have the original documents. And I go, where are the original documents for the Book of Mormon? You know, <laughs> and it's just because sometimes people get so argumentative, they, they'll just throw anything out there. I mean, go back to the cheating spouse, you know, they're just throwing anything out there that will stick. And we as Christians have got to be better than that. We, we don't want to use arguments that disprove what we are saying if someone were to think about it for a few seconds, you know? So like, we don't want to say, um, well, you know, you, you know, somebody saying they believe in science. It's like, I believe in science and I know everything in science, you know, points back to God. Well, yes, that's true. But now if they're going to start showing you modern science that disagrees with our biblical understanding of creation, you're going to have to qualify that, you know, you're going to have to say, all um, theories that have stood the test of time or things that 
good science has done with peer review, not just, uh, uh, you know, cutting out the rest of those who disagree, because there's a lot of disagreement with evolution, but everybody's pushing those people aside. So you would have to be more specific. So if you just make general statements and then you get rocked by somebody that goes, well, I just showed you something scientifically that disagrees with you, you know, but, um, you know, we, we know that ultimately all truth is on our side, but there may be something that someone says is true that we can't disprove in that moment. So we just have to be careful about how we put our stuff out there and not just try it. And, and I've seen people try to do this too, like, like, um, say with Bible contradictions or what apparent contradictions, somebody will say, like a Bart Ehrman at, at one point, uh, there's a, there's a variant that says, was Jesus indignant or was Jesus saddened? You know, it's like, the difference of a couple letters, you know, like mad or glad or like very similar in English. And it's like the same thing in Greek. And so the idea is, well, which one was Jesus? And the atheist is like pinning the Christian down. You believe in the inerrant word of God. We've got manuscripts that say he was glad and other manuscripts that say he was mad. Which one was it? And if you're an ignorant Christian, you'll just go both, you know, both. And because I got to believe in the inerrant word of God. And then the atheist is like, it can't be both, you know. Uh, cottonhead and Ninimagan, you know, it can't be both. It's not, you know, the writer wrote down one. And so at that point, what do you say is, I don't know, but I trust God knows, you know, it's one or the other. And it's, it's not a contradiction to the story. Jesus does get mad and sometimes he's glad. So we don't know the variant and which one it should be. That's why we have to choose which one has the best evidence and say, Lord, grant us the gift to, to be wise in our, uh, in our interpretation of these scriptures, you know, and, you know, because the, the evidence could go either way. We really don't know. And this is where we go into a whole nother discussion. And we'll get more into that in the gospel and the defense of the Bible is, is whenever we're talking about variants in the Bible, we're never talking about a puzzle piece that puts together a hundred piece puzzle. And we only have 95 pieces. All of our variants have to do with additions and the kind that I just mentioned so it's never a 98 piece puzzle for 100 pieces. It's, it's like a it's like a um, 120 pieces on the table for a 100 piece puzzle. And we're just trying to figure out why did these extras come along in here? And and they're generally just so simple like that. But we we do our best to try to figure out which word is it. And that's really one of the only ones out of all of these variants that actually would even change the meaning of the sentence. The rest of them don't even really change the meaning of the sentence out of all of the variants and all the thousands of manuscripts and that, that land yep, that extra that hangs around. It's probably only, I think like 10 to 12 verses that may actually change the meaning of the verse, but not the meaning of the passage or those things. And so once again, we just, when we're showing people our, the, the truth, we don't want to pretend we know more than what we do. Sometimes we have to say, well, I don't know, man. I honestly, I, I wasn't ready for that question. I don't know. Let me get back to you on it. Let's, Let's go back to something I do know, um, you know, and then we show them the infinite regresses of their idea and just say, hey, just to let you know, I'm going to go back and check on this variant and understand textual criticism better. But you have to figure out why you're here today. <laughs> you have to discover why your brain is working, why gravity works. You figure that out and I'll go back and figure out textual criticism, you know. Any other discussions on what I thought would be a more lively day, but it's still lively. One more minute left. Any discussions? I thought maybe somebody would be all passionate, want to debate me, try to test out some of these arguments. Pastor, I'll take you on. <laughs> hey, hey uh, Pizzo, uh, quick question. Um, is, there, is there a simpler way to explain the... Uh a simpler way of explaining the uh, ont uh, ontological argument? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No, okay. no, no, no. This, this, this is the inside joke. So welcome. Welcome to the club. You get the inside joke now. Uh, the inside joke of philosophy is that the ontological argument is either the most brilliant thing we've come up with or one of the craziest things. So it's, it's always been that way. You're just going to have to study it more, watch the video, uh, listen to people discuss it, uh, mm -hmm. see it in debate. If you, if you ask me for resources, I can show you where William Lane Craig uses it and puts the smack down. But I think the simplest it can be is in our book with Dr. Frame. So I would say read that section again with Dr. Frame. It, 
And, and, and remember, when you got to reread things, that is not a problem. I, I love what J.P. Moreland said. If you're understanding 100% of all you're reading and studying, you're not challenging yourself. Some of these mm-hmm. lectures I listen to, man, I'm telling you, I'm like only understanding 20% of it. And it just, you listen to it again, you listen to it again, you read through it. So I would say read through frames, uh, explanation of it, look at the video again. I've probably been looking at the ontological argument for about seven years, and I probably would only use it in the sense that if someone just said God is uncomprehensible, I would say, no, he's not. He is comprehensible. And that's a, that's an evidence that that would. So I guess maybe I do have a way of simplifying it, but if I had to do to defend it, I would have to go into all the things that we were talking about when it comes to possible worlds. And so that, that, that's the idea. And it's called uh, modal logic, Uh, understanding possible worlds and how you describe them is a part of uh, a philosophical discussion that will require you to understand the basis. It's almost like you're learning a code because I know you do graphics and you're you're like, you're going to go learn, you know, like an animation program. Uh, Understanding modal logic and possible worlds is kind of like a framework in philosophy. And that's where uh, it was brought up in that in that uh, video. But uh, the best way that I would just simply say it is, is, uh, yeah, you can conceive God, you can't conceive a married bachelor, and that's true in all possible worlds. And that's like, uh, like logic is true in all possible worlds, etc. And then I would say, the fact that you can't disprove the rationality of God through anything that's inconsistent, and they try, they try to say it's inconsistent, but they fail, then I would say that shows you that that he must exist. And for all of these other reasons, you know, the Bible and all of that, but uh, that's what would be where I was at. And I'm Googling some things, possible worlds. There's a lot of good stuff that comes up there, modal logic, but even like I said, frame and the video uh, and um, William Lane Craig. If you look up William Lane Craig ontological argument, you'll be good. All right, Chris, uh, would you pray for us, please? And we'll take, we'll talk after class. Thank you for that thumbs up, but we'll talk more after class if you need further explanation yeah absolutely uh well Lord, we just thank you for this uh this opportunity to be in a class today uh just really enjoying uh just just having our brains kind of open up a lot more to uh, some of these things i know these are very uh uh very new for many of us so uh we just thank you Lord. we pray for uh, just the understanding uh you know not that it's just uh you know mental knowledge but also for heart knowledge for us as well so i pray that you continue on in us and, and uh, give us a grace to understand, uh, but we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.